today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. If you were with us last football season, you know our Mondays are spent with Michael Phillips. Uh, of course, our colleague down at 910 The Fan in Richmond, host of MP on the mic, 9, er, 910 The Fan, 10 a.m. to noon. Miguel, hello, my friend. How are you? Uh, back by popular demand or just back. Uh, I'll take it either <laughs> way. Uh, it's, it's good to be back with you, Craig. And uh, I'm excited for a fun season. And uh, uh, I think uh, I think we're gonna have a lot to talk about. I do. Um, I, I thought it was interesting uh, when I was having my little uh, chat with with Logan before we recorded the pod today. I was like, "Do you have any big takeaways, or is this just kind of a preseason game?" And he goes, "No, this is just kind of a preseason game." Do you have any big takeaways, or for you, is this just kind of a preseason game? Not not only was it a game really largely devoid of juice, I, I would guess. In our audience, right, the people listening to me, listening to you, listening to the Team 980, listening to the fan, are people who are dialed into the commanders, right? People who care about the commanders, people who want to know everything about the commanders. And we love those people. We talk to those people. I would venture a guess that the majority of people listening didn't watch the game, uh, didn't catch the game, uh, maybe saw the Jaden Daniels highlight and that was it. It was at noon. It was a Saturday afternoon. It's the middle of the summer. The Olympics were on. None of the starters were in. Uh, it was, even by preseason standards, I feel like largely devoid of juice. You know, I, I got my question board. We can talk about that. There are a lot of questions I would like to see answered over the next few weeks, and I don't feel like I got great resolution on many of them. No, I think that's a great point. It's a game that does kind of result in more questions than it does answers. That, I'm trying to think of, of where I would have been at the time that this game kicked off because it's six hours uh, difference in Paris and here, and this was Saturday, right? This was, uh, I think this was between soccer and basketball, uh, if that, if that for Okay, so for I, think, I think the soccer game was wrapping as this game kicked off, which yeah. I was there. So I would have been at Parc de Prince, which is a nice, fun bit. Uh, bet, better decision, yeah. uh, for sure. Better than uh, Florham Park, New Jersey? Be, better than Florham Park, New Jersey. And, and the other thing is, and this is going to happen this week, too, when you pair the joint practices with the preseason game, it does take some air out of the preseason game because I, I think you talk to coaches and you talk to people who are in the league, they tell you, they're not exaggerating when they say, the joint practices are more important and, and, and do deliver more information to the coaches and so it's just another data point of like man they you know they learned stuff but it wasn't on tv at noon on saturday right and i think the other thing to kind of be wary of that people then be like well why don't you guys talk about the joint practices is well one neither of us were there i just said where i was uh and and michael uh is you know not on the beat daily in the way that he used to be when he was writing for the times dispatch etc and even like you know kime wasn't wasn't up there like it's just the the media environment is different Um, so you kind of have to, you know, obviously like we pay attention to those that did make the trip, uh, with with great intention, but even some of those folks were like where we were watching those practices and where like, you know, say Emmanuel Forbes was getting beat by Garrett Wilson. Like it was so far away because of the the structure of the layout of the Jets practice facility that it was kind of hard to tell what was happening. So I think that's, that's worth mentioning. And thus we wind up talking more about the game than the joints, even if internally the joints uh, wind up telling the coaches more. So with that said, Michael Phillips, of course, nine ten fan down in Richmond. What are, what's number one on your question board? Let's go through Michael Phillips question board here and have discussions about where we think some of these answers might ultimately lie. Yeah. And certainly number one on the good list, by the way, was the Jaden Daniels throw. And we can get into that. If you want to be really excited about that throw, Please, by all means, don't feel like I'm throwing <laughs> cold water on what you're doing. Very exciting throw. I enjoyed watching it a lot. Uh, question board. Number one's offensive line. It has to be. Um, not, that, not that everything rides with Brandon Coleman. But, man, if Brandon Coleman turns out to be good, that takes you a long way towards having a serviceable offensive line uh, for your young quarterback. Uh, I think it was encouraging to see John Bates blocking on the Jaden Daniels touchdown run. That tells me. There's potentially a role for a lot of two tight end sets, the ability to get a second tight end in there, another blocking body. But it does, you know, this all serves to kind of 
uh, obscure the larger point, which is I'm just not sure this is an NFL caliber offensive line, and that's not great for a rookie quarterback. Yeah, so uh, my question in response to your question on the O-line is, have we reached a point of no return, specifically with the Coleman injury? Because I do think he was on track to be the starter, and while that was going to come with its rookie bumps, like he had, like he's shown enough, I think, for, from what people covering camp would tell you that he was – like he was going to be an okay starter this year with with some really high upside moving forward because of how kind of freakishly athletic he is, how big he is. Like he's he checks a lot of boxes. He's just inexperienced, and thus he's a third rounder. Where maybe if he had played a lot more football to this point, he could have been a first round caliber player. And we'll see what he is in the NFL. But now that he's hurt, and we see the limitations of Trent Scott, we hear about them in the joint practices, see them in the game. Uh, Cornelius Lucas, we know what limitations he's got. Have we reached a point where they have to sign someone? I guess I just come back to who is it, you know, is who's out there and, and who do you, who do you go get? And it, it's funny because the guy who's your most prominent holdout right now is Trent Williams, who uh, is not coming back here. Obviously the 49ers will, will figure it out with him, but you know, I, it's a tough market. And, and part of it is in, in the off season, the reason they went so high in the draft, you know, you, you look at the draft and quarterback, 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 left tackle, left tackle, left tackle, uh, the good ones don't make it to free agency anymore, and the good ones don't make it to the market anymore. And uh, Look, I, I think you absolutely scour the waiver wires. I think you scout the other teams. I, I think cut day, you know, you, you are out there. You are active. You are looking to bring somebody in. Uh, but you're not going to find miracles at this point of the game, and I think that's the reality they're going to have to come around to. And, uh, you know, as, as much as I don't want a lot of it to ride on Brandon Coleman – I think a lot of it rides on Brandon Coleman. Yeah, so I've got I've got two kind of uh, additional points here, and I'm curious your response to both of them. Uh, the first is I was impressed with the way Cliff called the game, um, mm-hmm. b- which kind of showed an understanding of what he had offensively and how he had on the line. I'm curious what you think of how sustainable that is, and also maybe if that's even the best path for Jaden as well to take a lot off his plate in his rookie year. Yeah, I, I like that, and I, I think there will be a lot of that. And uh, kind of the uh, the reverse of last year, right, where they're down down twenty late and they're still throwing the ball. Um, I was also impressed with the tempo of the game. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury calling the plays in quickly, getting to the line quickly. There wasn't a lot of five on the play clock, four on the play clock, that kind of thing. They moved at a nice tempo. It looked like a group that had practiced together, knew what they were doing. Uh, that's not always a given in the preseason. You know that. Uh, all, all these alignments and combinations and, and backups coming in and starters coming in. It, it can be messy. It wasn't messy. Um, you got the sense this was a well-rehearsed, well-practiced operation. Uh, that doesn't speak to the play calling itself, but I think it speaks to the larger organizational ability of Cliff Kingsbury. He knows what he's doing. He's a professional. Uh, he got them in. He got them out. He kept them moving. I liked that. Um, certainly, the more you take off of your rookie quarterback's plate, the better. Um, I, what I go around on with Cliff Kingsbury, I do this on my show all the time because I, I don't have a fresh talking point here, Greg. It's just the same one. He is, statistically speaking, really good to start a season, yes. any season, yeah. college, pro, anywhere, anytime. He's phenomenal. You give him the off season, you give him a whiteboard, you give him a film room, he's good. And your observation was an extension of that. He's, he's really good in these environments. In week 10 and week 11, he gets less good, historically speaking. And uh, I, can't, I can't do anything other than just note that and say that and say I'm leery of that, I'm watching out for that. Um, and, you know, there's going to come a time of reckoning on that. But statistically speaking, he's probably going to be really good in the first four weeks. No, I think that's a, a good point uh, and so good, Michael, in fact, that I made it earlier in the show. Is like, hey. I really, really like what I saw, but I'm also going to be a realist about what Cliff's history has been. And I'm very much hoping that this is the year that it just, with just offensive coordinator duties on his plate, that he figures it out uh, in a way that he did not as a head coach, either at Texas Tech or in Arizona. The other uh, thing that I am curious uh, your take on when it comes to the offensive line is Michael Phillips is our guest here on the Hoffman Show Mondays with Michael following Commander's Games here on the Team 980 um, is I don't really hold the offensive line against them in the bigger picture. 
In other words, I knew, as they, I'm sure, do, that this is a potential problem and that they were yep. taking a bit of a risk. But like you said earlier, like it, it takes high draft capital or a free agent that doesn't come to the market to come to the market in order to get a left tackle and to, to sure up an offensive line with really high caliber players. And they use their first round pick on a quarterback. I think that was a better option than taking a, a, an offensive lineman. Uh, at number two. So I, I just kind of look at this as a multi-year project and there's only so much you can do in year one. And while I get the consternation about putting said number two pick behind this O-line, I don't really know what the other option was. And in that way, I don't really hold it against them, knowing that they'll probably address this as the primary concern in year two. Yeah, and if James Daniels plays well this year, it makes everything easier, right? We talk about wooing free agents and wanting free agents to come play for you. Obviously, Adam Peters is a big part of that strategy. Uh, you know that. I know that. People want to play on an Adam Peters team. Uh, he takes care of them. Uh, he, he's good to them. He creates environments they want to be in. Part two of that, if you can get some Jaden Daniels success this year, guys are going to want to play here. And that, that helps you enormously into free agency. Ooh, that's a hot place. I want to be there. I want to be in Washington. They got the good GM. They got the young quarterback. Uh, you can do yourself a lot of good where, you know, maybe you have to overpay this off season. If you can put it together, if you can have a good year next year, maybe you can be paying at, at, at a better rate. And I, I think everybody sees that, especially, yeah, I'm still at number one on my questions list. Also on my list is receiver. You know, there's no need to force something. And I, you and I both understand how silly the Brandon and I chatter is. There's no need to force something here because, a good season this year can create an environment where you are driving free agency, not the other way around next year. For sure. And when it comes to Ayuk, if they don't get a deal done in San Francisco and he just plays it out this year, you don't want a Carmelo Anthony yourself, uh, as the nope. Knicks famously did back in the day, where they traded away all the players that Carmelo Anthony would have signed to play in New York with six months later for Carmelo Anthony and were never as good as they could have been. Uh, all right, so let's let's keep talking about receiver. Uh, is number two on your question board here. I'm guessing Dotson is, is a big part of this. What do you make of him playing more snaps than anyone who is not an offensive lineman in this game? Sure, and I think I had framed this. I know I had framed this coming into the game as you've got your number one, you've got your number two, and you've got a really kind of muddied mix for number three, uh, which needs to sort itself out. Luke McCaffrey, Deami Brown, Alameda Zacchaeus. I mean, we can run down the list. Obviously, there's Jamison Crowder, Mitchell Tinsley as well. There's a lot of guys in that mix. I'm now reconsidering that this might be a number one and a muddied mix after that, two, three, four, five, the, the works. Um, I had seen John Dotson as because he's so talented, because he's such a Chris Brown runner, he, he'll just inherit the number two spot. The message I saw communicated on Saturday was, buddy, you are fighting it out with the rest of them. And uh, I was, I was, that made sense to me with Jamin Davis. That made sense to me. With Emmanuel Forbes, that caught me off guard with John Dotson. What when you say fighting, like are we talking about fighting for reps, or do you think that his roster spot is is up for uh, No, he'll be yeah. he'll he'll be on the roster, but I, I think they're sending the message you're not you're not running out of the tunnel as a starter. That's not guaranteed right now. Um I think when the dust clears, he will run out of the tunnel. He will be a starter. Um Forbes is probably the more glaring example because I, I think you know, and, and we're not there day in, day out. He, even the beat writers aren't, aren't truly there for everything. I think a lot of the Emmanuel Forbes putting him as second string, making him play more in the preseason game, I don't think it's so much message sending to him. I think it's an acknowledgement to the rest of the team of what they're seeing, right? You, you can't BS the team. And if the team sees a guy struggling in practice, and if a team sees a guy, you know, the other players see a guy, who's not playing up to his potential, you know, if you ignore that on the depth chart, if you ignore that with preseason playing time, they start to wonder how fair and how open these competitions truly are, right? So I think it was message sending to the rest of the team of, we see what you see, we're going to make this kid work for it. For sure. And I think the thing with Forbes uh, is he's not playing as bad as fans think, but that it's not, that's not actually an absolution of him. 
and down in, down out, there's stuff to really like for him, with him, and he's willing to be a little bit more physical, and like on horizontal routes, he's great. But this is a league built on explosive plays, and he just keeps giving up explosive plays. And I, I think the other thing that's interesting, Michael, and I'm curious for the guests that you've had on your show and anything you're hearing about this is – like the way they're talking about Forbes and the way they're talking about Jamin Davis are very, very different. Like with Forbes, there is some frustration and like some, maybe there's not the buy-in there, the work being done, whatever. With Jamin, it's like, this dude is trying, like we know we've given him a really hard task. We know that it's going to be an uphill battle, but he is working his ass off and we believe in him that, that with what he's shown us as like a human being, that he can ultimately pull this off. And I don't get the sense that that's the case with Forbes. Yeah, and, and to build on Jamin, the coaches are trying to figure out what the this is that they want him to pull off, right? So it's it's not even, you know, oh, Jamin Davis is going to be this role. We're waiting for him to figure it out, to put it together, whatever. I think the coaches are figuring out what role is best suited for him, how to best use him. They they like the work ethic. They, they like that he's getting after it. They don't know where to put him and where to line him up and when to use him and, and, and when he's best. Right. So Emmanuel Forbes, that's a little different because that's a corner. Right. And, and, and I agree with what you're saying. You got to push the buttons there. You got to get him motivated. Any play can be a big play with Jamin Davis. I get the sense. It's far more. What are the situations we want to use him in? How do we want to use him in those situations? Where do we want to line him up and where do we want to, what do we want to ask him to do? And I get the sense the coaching staff maybe doesn't fully have answers to all those questions right now. Uh, Michael Phillips wrapping up with us here on a Monday, MP on the mic, 10 a.m. to noon on 910 The Fan in Richmond, which, of course, you can also listen to on the free, free, they said, Michael, Odyssey app. Um, how concerned are you or not about the kicking situation? Well, I'm, I'm glad this isn't a, a playoff caliber team. Otherwise, I'd be doing a lot more hand-wringing, right? If, if, if a, a missed kick is the difference – between let's say six and 11 and seven and 10 uh that's sad like you'd rather make the kick and win the game um everything this season though craig is going to be filtered through how are the young guys developing how's the roster coming along um i'll eat my words if they miss the playoffs because of a kick it just feels like this is the right year to be going through this where if a kick costs you a game Everybody's going to be mad. They're going to cut the kicker. Um, But on the whole, it's not going to reframe how we see the season, how we see it as a success or a failure, the results or anything like that. Uh, Whereas in a couple of years, if things are going right here, if this is a team with real ambitions, with playoff ambitions, with NFC East ambitions, with NFC title game ambitions, you got to get that stuff locked down. Because if you assemble the roster you want to assemble and you lose a game because of a kicker, uh, then then the town burns down, as they say. Yeah, that's actually a great perspective. Like, for me, I'm not concerned because I think that the current kicker is not on the roster, which ultimately means, like, it's someone else's second-best kicker, which is not ideal. Um, and it's also, like, I, I just have a hard time getting worked up about it because it's not their fault that Brandon McManus was alleged to have been sure. a terrible human being and then not told them that he was going to get sued for it. Um, but, uh, I think that's actually a really, really good perspective too. That like, it also, if it's the difference between six and seven wins, that could be the difference in getting the best left tackle in the draft or not. So who knows? Secretly, Michael, kick, bad kicker, good weapon. Eh? Craig eh? Hoffman. Eh? Yeah. Mr. Silver lining. I, I, I mean, there is, there is looking on the bright side of life and then there is, there is that take. That was, that was phenomenal. I, I just was building on your analysis, Michael. We, it's, we're a team. We do this together. Uh, that's why that's why this man is on Mondays with us during football season. Great to have you back, pal. Uh, looking forward to returning serve on your show uh, as well uh, whenever you need me this season. Uh, and, and good to talk. I uh, hope you had a great summer. Uh, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Yep. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right. That's Michael Phillips, everybody, with us here on the Hoffman Show. Anthony, I'm not going to lie. I'm very surprised as you still sit there in your bucket hat looking fantastic. Um, you can take the tag off. That's really yours. You can keep it. Um, so it's you know that's that's up to you. Um, I can't believe that Michael and I got through that entire interview doing no Paris bits, no French bits, no nothing. Yeah, I'm a little surprised. I thought she was going to maybe start off with it or ma- conclude it, but it's, it's, yeah. there was enough substantive football to, <laughs> that stopped us from doing bits in the past. But uh, 
We just we got down to business. I see. This is the Hoffman Show on the T980 and the Odyssey app.